Are you interested in deepening your spiritual awareness and discovering your true nature as divine? Well, you're in the right place. Welcome to Align with the Divine. With me, your host, Patricia DiOrio, spiritual mentor, sacred storyteller, and professional intuitive. Join me and my amazing guests each week for a deep dive into the exciting world of spirituality. Align with the Divine will inspire you to embrace your innate power to create your reality. It will motivate you to move past your limited thinking, release your subconscious programming, and show you how to live in the present moment with clarity and focus. Get involved with the show. Send your email to patricia at patriciadiorio.com. This is a line with a divine. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to a line with a divine podcast. Now, every time I do this podcast, I say I'm so excited about this guest, and I am because I'm having an opportunity to interview people that I interviewed many years ago. And today, I have the honor to interview a fellow that uh, I've been a big fan of for a long time. His name is Jacob Glass. You probably know him through his connection to A Course in Miracles. You know, I'm a Course in Miracles groupie. I did Course in Miracles for eight years, and I actually did discussion groups in my home. And uh, one of our favorite people to listen to around the course was Jacob Glass. He used to come to Santa Barbara on a regular basis and speak at the Victoria Street Theater. And he's so so versed in the Course in Miracles and in applying it to our daily lives in a very practical way. Plus, he is very funny and irreverently so. So today you're going to have the opportunity to hear a fun conversation with Jacob Glass and me. Jacob Glass is a spiritual teacher. And although I hesitate to use those words in regard to myself, I am very committed to my spiritual work. And I invite you to take a look at my website. It's a fairly new website, alignwiththedivine.net, and um, find out what I'm up to. I work in groups with people, taking them through the word book, I Am the Word. We do a chapter a week over a three-month program. I also work one-on-one with my clients to really help them move to their next level of awareness. My work is really about helping people deepen their spiritual awareness moving from the conversation, the belief system that we're spiritual beings having a human experience, that we're God in the body, that we're spirit in form, to knowing it like we know our names. No one has to ask us if we believe our name is whatever. We know it. And this is really what my work is about, helping you move to that knowing. And Jacob and I are going to be talking about that today. To give you a little bit more information about Jacob, he has a great he has a great vitae. Uh, he is a spiritual teacher and a writer. He's written many books and he's written many journals. Uh, I was particularly impressed in seeing this journal he wrote for young men. You know, young men really don't, we don't think about young men journaling, but this is a wonderful uh, presentation for younger men to get into their spiritual life through self reflection. So he's a law author of 11 spiritual books. And as I said, several innovative journals and prayer books for self-love and personal growth. He's an author, teacher, spiritual success consultant, as well as a meditation and visualization teacher. He is also a non-denominational minister with over 35 years of experience in spirituality and mysticism with A Course in Miracles, which he has taught in collaboration with Marianne Williamson, renowned teacher of the course as well. So that's just a a quick overview, a scratching the scratch of what this fellow has done. So I invite you to go to his website, jacobglass.com, and um, check out all the work he's done. So I think you're going to really enjoy this conversation. So sit back, relax, and listen or watch and have fun. Well, I am so delighted to welcome Jacob Glass to Align with the Divine podcast. I can remember uh, hearing Jacob speak many, many times when he would come up to Santa Barbara, and it's thrilling for me to have him on this podcast. And also, as we were reminiscing before this, um, 
Jacob reminded me that he was on my television show, The Paradigm Shift, way back in the 90s. My goodness, yeah. that was a long time ago. Back so, Jacob, day. thank you for being here today. I'm so delighted to have you as a guest. My pleasure. Um, yeah, yes, definitely, and mine as well. So I know this question may sound a little bit trite, but I'm curious, you know, what brought you to the spiritual life such that, you know, you're a minister, although you call yourself a brother, I mean, what what brought you? What was your upbringing like that moved you in that direction? Of course, I don't remember this, but my parents, you know, had me baptized in whatever religion they were at the time, Christian religion. And then a couple of years later, well, before I was still in school, they and one of my brothers converted to Catholicism. So then I was baptized in the Catholic Church and I went to Catholic school. So I went to Catholic school from grades one through six. And so I always say God drafted me because I would not volunteer for things, but I would just be told you're going to do this. So a priest would come to the classroom because the there was a the the school was really run by the nuns. There was a priest who ran the diocese, but the nuns lived in part of the school. And so the nuns taught classes. So the priest would come one day to class and say, you know, we need altar boys. And then the nun would choose me. So I was an altar boy. A couple of years later, the priest came and they were looking for lectors, which are the people who read from the gospel during mass. Mm -hmm. So then I was drafted for that. It was not like, do you want to? It was, this is what you're going to do. And it just, that has just been my entire life is I've always been drafted. When I was in high school, I left Catholic school in sixth grade. In seventh grade, I started public school. And I was practically the only Catholic in the whole high school. And I remember being in, because I was taking um, secretarial classes. And that was like my, I was going to be an office worker. And so I was in FBLA, which was the Future Business Leaders of America. And the teacher of that said, you're going to be the chaplain. Well, there was not even any such thing, but they just thought I was, because I was Catholic, that was some special <laughs> kind of, so I was the chaplain of FBLA. Shortly after I graduated from high school, because I had all these, I took shorthand and typed and all this stuff. I got a call from, and I didn't even know this place existed, but it was a Franciscan monastery that was like a couple of towns over and the priest who ran it called me and he, he had gotten my number from somebody. I hadn't applied or anything. And he basically hired me to come. And everything has always been about prayer because what they had was basically a prayer ministry. So they would do what the Catholics call novenas, yeah. which were these masses that they would do big mail campaign, like twice a year where they would send out to their mailing list where you would have novenas for the dead and so I would type the letters you know and so it just continued on and on and on everywhere I went it just seemed like even if I wasn't that religion I would be called in to do things so in 1983 I moved to uh San Diego and where were you born where was all this happening the this was all happening in Pennsylvania Oh, and oh, so it's East Coast oh, or East Coast? Yeah, I so am from Connecticut. Coast. Yeah, mine was opposite. I was uh, public school until age six, age six, until sixth grade. And then I went into junior high and high school, Catholic school. Yeah, we just had the reverse. We just had the reverse. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that, you and I ought to have lunch someday and compare our Catholic experience. Catholic story. Yeah, exactly. Oh, God. Exactly. So I ended up in San Diego. and But I didn't have a car or anything. And I didn't have a job. I was... Um, staying with a friend of mine from Pennsylvania who had moved the year before to San Diego. And I got very depressed. It was so crazy because I don't think this has ever happened since, but it rained every day in San Diego really? for almost three months, just no solid, way. endless rain every day. And so even walking somewhere was almost impossible because I lived up on this big hill so I'd be trapped at home, couldn't get a job, didn't have a car, started getting very depressed. And I saw this woman minister on television named Terry Cole Whitaker, who had a ministry in San Diego and did a television show 
that went to a lot of the major cities. And that was kind of, and at the same time, I was reading, which had just come out, um, Shirley MacLaine's Out on a Limb. <laughs> you and I are so, so yeah. sync with each yeah. other. It's amazing. Because I watched Terry Cole Whitaker too. I loved her. Yeah. So Terry taught, you know, from everything. And I was out at the this place that we live. We were renting this townhouse. So it was like a townhouse community that had tennis court and a pool. So I was out by the pool reading this out on a limb. And this guy comes over to me and starts talking to me about the book. And if you like that, blah, 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 Terry Cole Whitaker. Well, I didn't have a car to go anywhere. So I ended up going to church with him one Sunday. And then I just was done. I never looked back. That became almost my whole life, really. I was going to Sunday services. I was volunteering on the phone lines. I was going to Wednesday night service. And then you're talking about with Terry Cole Whitaker? With Terry Cole Whitaker. With Terry, okay. Just a few months into that, about six months into that, she started teaching a class, which was a 10-week series called Mastery and Faith. And this was huge. There were 800 people in this class. And people flew in from Alaska every week for it. Like, it was huge. Wow. And part of the homework for that was to do the workbook of A Course in Miracles. And she was teaching a lot from A Course in Miracles at that time, as well as a lot of other stuff. So that was really how I was introduced to the course. But I was also doing all this other stuff, which was because she was affiliated with Church of Religious Science. So I was doing all the Ernest Holmes teachings and all of that stuff. So I sort of had both of those. I took practitioner classes in Science of Mind and all of that stuff. So I went through, you know, both. In 1985, I moved to West Hollywood. This was the first wave of AIDS. And so along with that, there was this huge sort of um, spiritual growth of people who were serving people with AIDS. So I started to go see Marianne Williamson, who was lecturing on A Course in Miracles. And because there were so many, that it, it just exploded because of AIDS, really. And Louise Hay was lecturing on Wednesday nights at something called the Hay Ride. So I was going to see Louise Hay while I was taking these classes uh, at a church of religious science church there. So all of those things went on for like the next five years until I moved the first time to Santa Barbara in 1990. So that was sort of all of that kind of just a lot of apprenticeship and education and learning and growing and and just failing all over the place. Just <laughs> failing all over the place. So the, by the time I moved to Santa Barbara, I always say I moved in failure and financial ruin. So I moved with a friend of mine moved me in her Carmen Ghia. <laughs> with my, everything I owned in the world. I was 30 years old and everything I owned in the world fit into her Carmen Ghia. That's <laughs> how little I had <laughs> when I moved to Santa Barbara. And uh, I started going around to like the Church of Religious Science and Unity Church and all of that. But at that time, it was, frankly, it was a lot of blue-haired old ladies. And they were not talking about anything that was going on in the world at the time. That Certainly nobody was talking about AIDS. And I had had all these dynamic, amazing teachers. And here, there was no pulse in most of these people. What inspired you to move to Santa Barbara? I was out of money and out of everything. I was ready to be homeless. And so a friend of mine that I knew from Terry Kowitiker Ministries had moved to Santa Barbara a year prior to that. And she said, well, why don't you come and see if you can make a go of it in Santa Barbara? You know, and I had just given up all the, you know, teaching and all of that stuff. I was like, that has not worked for me at all. So I'm just going to go do secretary work. So I became a Kelly girl. So she had a guest room and she said, like, you know, you can stay with me for a little while. And once you get a job, then you get up on your feet and everything. So I became a Kelly girl at Kelly Girls Temp Agency. And that was it. I was just going to do secretarial work. And that was it. But I needed some kind of to be fed spiritually. And this was before there was even any Internet. So. I went around to the various churches and it was just so 
deadly dull and like I mean they were practically singing dirges in church <laughs> it was so awful <laughs> and so I said uh well I'll check with the miracle distribution center who has the listing of you know all these course of miracles groups so they had listed that the there were two course of miracles groups at the unity church so I called the unity church and they said they've disbanded so if you would like to start a study group, then maybe you could do that. And I said, I don't want to do a study because I had done study groups and I hated them. Really? I said, but I would be willing to lecture on the course. So that's how that started was I started on in November of 1990, I guess. At what they called Unity House, which was a little house mm -hmm. that they at that time owned, which was on the back property. And it was a literal house. Yeah, I know the house. And things. Yeah. yeah. So I had this little group in the living room. There was like 12 people. And we just grew from there. We just started with 12. And I never thought anything. I didn't think like this will be work for me because I didn't think. I thought if it didn't work for me in L.A., it's not going to work for me in Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara is not where you move to have a career. You don't go like, oh, I'm going to make a career in Santa Barbara. That's not the move, you know. So I just was like, well, and what I used to say for years was, if you can't find Marianne Williamson, become Marianne Williamson. And there was nobody here who was teaching who had any kind of dynamic whatever. So I thought, well, that must be me then. So I'll just do it for myself because I need to be spiritually fed. So I'll just be the one that feeds myself. I'll just do this and teach. Because that's certainly what the Course says, too, is that you're always teaching what you want to learn. So I just started doing that, just thinking it will just be, you know, this will be my spiritual food. I'll do this. I, it was Saturday mornings, and I'll work for Kelly Girls. And eventually I was working uh, as a temp at Child Protective Services for the county. And I was doing that part time and just... That's how I thought that it would ever be, basically. But it just grew and grew and grew. And then we moved from Unity House into the chapel, which sat like 30 or 40 people. And then I added another night. So I was doing it Saturday mornings and Tuesday nights. And then after like a year or so of that, then we outgrew that and we moved into the sanctuary. So it just kind of evolved, you know, over a couple of years so, so where where does your where do your talks at victoria street theater fit into this chronolo chronology here at a certain point <laughs> well as there was kind of this whole everything again you know just happens through this miraculous process of letting go and surrendering so one of the things that I had said early on, well, this was really in my first few months of living here. I moved here in August of 1990. And then in December, this friend of mine who I was living with, as I met her and her boyfriend, uh, we went to see mermaids at the Arlington. And I had never been to the Arlington before. And I'd never really kind of been to a theater like that before. Now, this was Christmas time. So they had the organ that would come out of the floor with Santa Claus playing Christmas and the stars on the ceiling. And it looks like you're outside in this village. And it was just so magical that I said to my friend as we were leaving, I said, I would love to have a Christmas Eve service here. And she just laughed at me because I had 12 people. <laughs> <That's not true. laughs> I was like, I would like to do Christmas Eve service here. <laughs> so I just sort of kept that as something. So then, like, it's maybe two years or so into this, two or three, I don't even remember. And we're in the sanctuary now. Um, and it's growing. And so I mentioned this to the group. And I said, someday, it was like some eventual day. I would like to do a Christmas Eve because still we had like maybe 200 people. And, I, and you know, this was still, I had no email list. I had no internet. There was no, this was all just word of mouth. I didn't mail things out to people. It was 100% word of mouth. So 
I mentioned this in the group and somebody came up and said, well, I know the person who blah, 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 the Arlington. And why don't you da, da, da. So I just started to just investigate it. And before you know it, I had like gone ahead and rented it. And I had no idea how I was going to like, I had no idea how I was going to do any of it because it was all just God, as far as I was concerned. <laughs> doors kept sort of opening. And then I was like, I don't have any clue, like how I'll pay for it, how we'll get people in it, how we'll do any of this. You know, you need insurance riders, which I didn't have. You needed all this stuff. Well, what happened was the... At that time, the Santa Barbara News Press would have, and I don't remember if it was weekly or monthly, but they would do almost like a half page uh, interview with some local spiritual teacher or group or whatever. And so they came to one of the lectures and interviewed me. Well, this actually coincided with when Marianne Williamson wrote A Return to Love. So it was actually like the same sort of period of time. Well, Marianne went on Oprah and Oprah, and she had never done this before. She had no book club or anything like that. And she had never even promoted a book before this, but she just sold the hell out of this book. Like I have bought a thousand copies of it and given to everyone I know. Everyone needs to have this book. So the book debuted at number one on the New York Times bestseller list. So people saw that in the news press and the news press actually said that. Marianne Williamson was blah, blah, blah. Well, then we just exploded. Then we just had like where by this time now we had not just, I'm lecturing twice a week and we have standing room only where people are sitting on the floor, people are outside in the foyer, they're, they're you know, using the microphones out there. So we can't even hold the people that we have. So that had been, you know, leading up to all of this. So then at some point, Marianne actually moved to Montecito from Los Angeles. I remember. Yeah. We had the same yoga teacher. <laughs> so, so all of these things just keep sort of perfectly falling into place. Where the person who, and she had always done Christmas Eve services in Los Angeles where she was living. And thought that she was going to do a Christmas Eve service in Los Angeles. But the person who did all of that booking for her had died that year and she didn't know that she didn't have a venue for Christmas Eve. So when she found out that she didn't have a venue for Christmas Eve, now, mind you, I've already rented the Arlington. I have no idea I'm going to do any of this stuff. <laughs> My phone rings and it's Marianne. And she said, I just found out that I don't have any place to be on Christmas Eve. Maybe you and I could, because she knew that I was lecturing on the course because I'd known her for years by that really? time. Really? Had, how did you meet her from the very beginning? Was it going all the way back? I'll go back to that in a second. Okay, all right. Um, so she said, maybe we could do something together. And I said, it just so happens <laughs> that I've rented the Arlington. <laughs> and da, 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 da. So that was how that happened. Um, and then we had so many people and it was standing room only and all this stuff that eventually one of the people, this is always sort of how it happened. Like I would be drafted or I would be so this guy comes up to me and says, you really need a larger venue. And I know the people who at that time were running what was then called the Vic. And so he said, I have talked to them about, you know, you being able to use the Vic and da, 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 da. And so that's how we left Unity and went over to what was then the Vic and then Victoria Hall and now the new Vic Theater. And all that. So, so that's basically how I ended up over there was we had really outgrown Unity and it was too hard just to make everybody comfortable there. So that's how we got over there. I met Marianne in, I guess like, it was probably, somebody took me, I moved to, Los Angeles in 19, in January of 1985. And the first month I was there, somebody took me to what was called uh, a special evening Courses and Miracles event with Marianne. So I'd never heard her or seen her before. 
So that was how I sort of first saw her. And then she was lecturing several times a week in West Hollywood. So I don't even remember, but I went to see her. And at that time, it was still very small. She maybe had at the most 100 people who were coming. And so, you know, it wasn't like masses of, you know, and she was not like, you know, oh, my God, she was like just somebody who lectured on the course. So I met her there and then I went and did a counseling session with her. And so that was how I got to know her, like personally was going to have a private session with her and then just did lots of, you know, it was a small, um, smallish group at that time. And I started going to this Sunday night prayer group that she did that there were only like six or seven people in. So, you know, you get to know people that way. And then we just, you know, it just sort of continued from there. How's your relationship with her now? I have not talked to Marianne in years, actually. Oh, really? Um, no, not probably like four or five years or something like that. Huh. I think she first started, I think the first campaign when she was running for president, I think that's the last time. Oh, and It was wow. just by email then. And she lives in Washington, somewhere like that. Right. Her, <laughs> you know, so. her life has changed dramatically. Yes. So let's talk, uh, let's talk about the Course in Miracles. I, I mean, I know you do a lot of different things, but I know the Course in Miracles is really the heart of your work. And for people that don't know about the Course, mm-hmm. there are a lot of people that don't know about the Course in Miracles. But how would you, for those that are listening or, or watching this podcast, how what would you say is the essence of the Course in Miracles? How how um, how would you describe the Course in Mir- a Course in Miracles? Well, Course in Miracles is first of all, it's a book. And it uses all of the language of like a course. So it talks about lessons and teachers and curriculum. And the idea is that you, and honestly, it's less about learning than it is about unlearning. (laughs) And the real purpose of the course is the attainment of inner peace. So It's published by the Foundation for Inner Peace. So its real entire goal is inner peace. And the way that it does that primarily, certainly, is through forgiveness. So forgiveness is a huge part of the path. So the purpose is inner peace, and the path is forgiveness. Mm -hmm. It uses a lot of traditional Christian language. So it talks about crucifixion and resurrection and atonement, but it means those things in a different way. It does not teach that Jesus died for your sins or that you need to accept Jesus as your savior. It It's not a religion, but it dr- does address universal spiritual themes. And even at the very beginning, it says this is a required course, but it doesn't mean that book It just means it is required of everybody to forgive in order to have the experience of inner peace. So whether you do that in a religious or non-religious or spiritual or non-spiritual is irrelevant in terms of what the course is teaching. There's a line, it might be in the teacher's manual that says some of the greatest teachers of God do not believe in God. Oh, interesting. I don't ever remember that, you know? Yes. Well, you know, when I- not (laughs) necessarily- It's not necessary to even believe in God in order to be a teacher of God. Just like it says, there are many people who talk about God all the time who are not teachers of God (laughs) because they're not teaching forgiveness and love. Right. They're not bringing it practically into their lives. Well, you know, uh, I think it was the last time I heard you speak at Unity. You said something that inspired me so much that I wrote a speech about it. And I presented it at Toastmasters, two different groups. (laughs) And I mean, it was, I went back to look at the notes on my phone because I take a lot of notes with my phone. Mm -hmm. And that was the only thing I had in my notes for you. And I went, wow, I can't believe it, but it inspired me so much. Mm -hmm. And you said, of course, it was, it was totally in sync with what was going on in my life. You said, um, I will forgive and this will disappear. I will forgive and this will disappear. And I was embroiled in this mm-hmm. situation. I'm still, I'm still dealing with the situation. But when I, when I got that, I went, oh my God, this is so true. I mean, I just need to forgive this person 
and lift him up, you know, and keep forgiving him. So I wrote a speech called the F word. <laughs> <I love it. laughs> but that's literally like that's directly from the course. That's a yeah. direct quote from the course. I will forgive and this will disappear. And this will disappear. I love that. So um, share a little bit about, about that. Share a little bit about the importance of forgiveness and inner peace. Yeah. If we, if we're not forgiving, including ourselves, you know, how can we have inner peace, right? Yeah. You yeah. can't. Well, it's hard to sort of <laughs> boil that down, <laughs> but I will say this. When A Course in Miracles talks about forgiveness, it's not in the way that we're used to thinking about forgiveness. So honestly, I don't even teach that much about forgiveness simply because the way the Course teaches it is so far removed from our experience of life. Because what the Course would actually say is the world itself is an illusion it's a dream. And therefore, there isn't even anything to forgive because the thing you think you're forgiving didn't even happen anyhow. <laughs> I know. I know. I so <laughs> that's very hard for people to grasp if they've not been doing this work for a long time anyhow. Um, in fact, in one of the, I don't know if it's in the course or one of the supplements of the course where it talks about the way that what the course calls the ego mind thinks of forgiveness is it looks at what someone does did and says, what you did is horrible and you're a horrible person, but I'm higher and more spiritual than you. So <laughs> I'm going to let it go. And the course calls that forgiveness to destroy. Oh, forget. Oh, I got to rush with that forgiveness. Yeah. to destroy. Forgiveness to destroy because it's basically Judging still people. holding on to that person as guilty. And so, you know, so I don't teach much about A Course in Miracles of Forgiveness. If someone's asking me about forgiveness, which is usually about something someone said, something someone did, something, I will usually turn them towards the work of Byron Katie. The work. Because yeah. she basically, what she's doing is in alignment with the Course, yeah. but she gives you an actual process to yeah. go through it that is very simple for people than this sort of abstract idea of, you know, it didn't really happen anyhow, and so let it go, and it's just an illusion and all that stuff. It's much easier to, as she says, when on this judge your neighbor worksheet, she says, give the ego its voice on paper. So instead of trying to rise above that, you can go right into it and yep. go ahead and judge the person and then get through the process that she teaches to where you turn it around. And because the, it's all of that is totally in alignment with the course, because the course says everything is projection. Right. And so her process is basically this is you projecting your own guilt out there and, you know, calling it them. They did it to me there, so and so and such and such. And so right. that's she has that thing called the turnaround where you turn it around and see how, you know. So I don't really teach a lot about forgiveness in terms of the course because it's just too hard for people to grasp if they haven't been really working. <laughs> like you know, well, you know. I mean, I I've done I've done the course, I've done the Abraham work, and I'm saying when I'm saying I've done it, I was really into it for a period of time, and I did it, you know, like that. And right. now I'm into um, I am the Word. I'm into the Word work. I call it. And there's now ten books with the eleventh book coming out. Paul Selig, who is the channel. And I, I want to move this into Helen Shookman, a conversation about Helen Shookman, because uh -huh. Paul, you know, Paul Selig, I interviewed him on my pad podcast, too. And, uh, you know, he was an uh, academic NYU playwright, uh, some of it of a performance artist and an empath. And he had a spiritual experience that awakened him such that these guides, you know, started coming through him. But he, like Helen Shookman, was very resistant. You know, he kind of dug his dug his heels in. And 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 so he in the beginning, because I've been following him now since 2009, and he's gone through a major transformation. I mean, he was a tenement bird, you know, he lived up in these high when he would 
when when he would do his his live streams, you know, you would see the tenements across the way. It was like watching an Alfred Hitchcock movie. <laughs> He'd be sitting there. You know, now he's in Hawaii. He's lost a bunch of weight. He's like really happy, ready to bring in a partner. I mean, it's just amazing to watch the transformation. So um I I wanted to and and I'm to to bring this full circle to what we were just talking about, the course, the word work. You know, everything that I've ever studied has really brought me to this place of acknowledging that everyone is God, that everyone is divine. There is nobody that not. Even the biggest jerks and the biggest horrible villains in the world are. And I think that's really the crux of the biscuit, if you will. I mean, that's being able to see them as God, despite the fact that they're perpetrating a war in the Ukraine or whether they're corrupting politics or whatever they're doing that they are divine. And I think that's what, you know, that's what Katie was talking about. And that's certainly how I was able to, what I was able to extract from the Course in Miracles. So share, share a little bit about your understanding of, of Helen Shookman. Cause I think it's interesting that, you know, even Jay-Z Knight with Ramtha, I mean, they, they struggled as mm -hmm. channels. I mean, they, they weren't, it wasn't a piece of cake. It wasn't a, you know, a joy ride. It was a struggle. Well, Helen, you know, was a self-described. Sometimes she would say that she was a militant atheist. She a was right. <laughs> she would sometimes say that, but um, you know, everything, everything is used basically. <laughs> so whatever, whatever is your life experience is going to be used, either by the ego or by what the course calls the Holy Spirit. So Helen, while her, she was, you know, Jewish, but they were not really practicing Jews from what I understand. And she had a, I don't know if it was a nanny. I think she, maybe she had like a black nanny who would sometimes take her to the Baptist churches when she was growing up. Oh. So that yeah. kind of gave her, you know, that, that Jesus experience of the music and, and, you know, everything that was being sort of preached in the Baptist church. And so she didn't go along with it, but she liked that. She liked, you know, the experience of it. So that was in her mind and in her consciousness. I know that at some point she also read a lot of Christian science. So she had, was not a Christian scientist, but she knew a lot about Christian science. And she was really kind of, she was very, very smart. She was a psychologist who really um, focused on like children who had mental disabilities at the time, whatever. I don't know what they call it now, but that's what, certainly what they called it then. And she was, I don't even know how old she was, at least in her 50s or 60s, I guess, when she started working, was hired by this man, Bill Thetford to be his assistant at Columbia University in like the psychology department. And she, Bill was gay and Helen was older than him. I think she was 10 or 15 years older than him, but she was very attracted to him. And in fact, was really in love with Bill. Really? Now she was married to somebody else, but she was really in love with Bill. So all of these things, everything is used that leads us <laughs> to, you know, where we're going to get to. So in this department that they were in, like so many, you know, hierarchical, and especially this was New York City. This was in the 1960s. This was all about ambition and your resume and your, all this stuff. And there was all this inner uh, department fighting. So they would have these meetings where Helen and Bill, would, their department would go and all these, and it would just be fighting, 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 you know, for funds and for this and for that and all this stuff and red tape and backbiting and, you know, this sort of ruthless career ambition and so on. Everybody trying to get their papers published and, you know, all this stuff. And Bill had. I guess he had really started to just do a little bit of reading on like Eastern meditation practices 
Now, Helen and Bill were, you know, sort of the two ways that the ego operates, where Bill was much more quiet and withdrawn. Helen was much more aggressive. And so the way their egos would react is that Helen would become aggressive and then Bill would just disappear. Now, of course, this really upset Helen because what she wanted was his company. So when he would leave, you know, and uh, there's stories of like Bill would always sort of stand in the doorway so he could get away. <laughs> because Helen would be aggressive, even though she, he was her supervisor, but she could be very, you know, aggressive and mean, actually. Uh, so at some point, so he was kind of afraid of her in a way. And he'd started reading these things about being more peaceful and relieving stress and really about having a more positive attitude. And so he had worked up this little speech to give to Helen to say, I don't want to keep doing what you and I have been doing, what we've been doing here. This is all not working. We've been doing it for years. It's not getting any better. I'm getting stressed out. And I've started, you know, looking at some other ways to deal with stress and all this. So he worked up this little speech, got up the courage to say to her, listen, what we're doing isn't working. And I think there must be another way. There must be a better way. I remember that. Remember that phrase. So Helen says to him, and Helen had all these sort of psychic experiences leading up to this anyhow, where when she met Bill, when she was called in for this interview, this voice in her head said, he's the one you're supposed to help. So she felt like she didn't have any idea what that meant. Uh, so he gives her the speech and she says, and he thinks that she's going to laugh at him or whatever, but she says, I will help you find the way. So of course, a miracle is now, you know, calls that a holy relationship. But basically from that moment on, she started having a lot of dreams that were basically about past lives and having lives with Bill before and all of this stuff that were in the months leading up to the scribing of the course. And, you know, she just thought of them as dreams at the time. And I do think she, at that time she wrote them down. I don't know if she wrote them down then or later. I think she was writing them down then. But then she started hearing this inner voice, she called it, that was saying to her, this is a course in miracles, please take notes. So this went on for a couple of days or even weeks. I'm not even sure how long. And, she, you know, if you're an atheist and you don't believe in anything except the physical universe and you're a psychologist who's hearing a voice, that's schizophrenia. So she's like, I must be losing it. So she goes to Bill and says, I think maybe I'm losing my mind. I keep hearing this inner voice that says, this is a course in miracles. Please take notes. And so he says, well, why don't you do it? Yeah, <laughs> just do it. Write down what the voice says, and then bring it to me. We won't tell anyone about it. And if it sounds crazy, then we'll know. You know, we need to do something about it. But just, why don't you just do it and the, and bring it to me, and we'll see. So then that just started a whole many years of that, where she would take these notes and then bring them to him, and he would type them out. She would take them in shorthand. And he would type them out. And from the beginning, he was like, this is wonderful. This is amazing. You know, let's continue with it. But they never thought that it was for anybody but them, just the two of them. So, I mean, this, you know, the book now is like 12 or 1300 pages of her taking these notes, thinking they're just for us. So there, there was an entire text of like, you know, hundreds of pages, six or seven hundred pages, and then started this thing called the workbook, which is 365 days of daily lessons. And that and then there would became the manual for teachers. And all through it, they would get along very well all around this experience of her coming together with them. And a lot of it was the Course of Miracles is really about relationships. The whole thing is basically about interpersonal relationships. So they were being given lessons about 
getting along with each other, getting along with other people in their lives. So it was very personal in the beginning where it would say, Bill, you need to da 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 da, Helen, you da 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 da, and then it would name their, you know, friends and all this stuff. That was all changed to make it universal later so that it was not just for Helen and Bill. But most of the guidance they were getting was really personal to their lives, but were universal lessons. So while they were doing that, they would get along, but then they would, when they weren't doing the course, when they were just working together and stuff, then in, in some ways it would go back to their old kind of antagonistic relationship. And mm -hmm. Helen never fell out of love with Bill and never really, uh, I think, got over the fact that he was gay and not interested in her. So in a way, she kind of resented the course because it wasn't really, the real point of it is, is that if she had not been sexually attracted to him, she would never have done the course. Wow, that's a new piece of information for it me. Was I really, never, I never it was really that. what allowed her to spend personal time with him. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, you know, it, it was just sort of their they would get along and not get along and get along and not get along and get along and not get along. And, and so um, that was her relationship with the course really was that she really took the role seriously of taking down the information, but she did not really apply it to herself. Mm -hmm. And so that was a lot of sort of the, um, the issue around Bill took it very personally and just spent the rest of his life doing everything he could to live the course. Mm -hmm. He had no interest in teaching the course or anything. He would go to other people's study groups. He was in a study group in San Diego for the last years of his life, and he would never take the role of teacher or authority or anything. He was just studying it like everyone else, like, I just want to live this. And consequently, his life got lighter and happier and more joyous. And Helen's life got more constricted, smaller, darker, more awful. She died a horrible death. It was just, it just really? was awful because she really did not want anything to do with doing what the course said. There was, she was sort of famous for saying, uh, I know it's true, I just don't believe it. You know, it's it's interesting because I and I don't know. Maybe you can you can confirm w what I heard. But what I heard was that, well, first of all, that it was Jesus actually that that was the the master teacher that was coming through her, and uh, she said, "Why me? You know, I'm a Jew. I'm an atheist. I don't believe this. Why me?" And the answer she heard was. Because I knew you would do it. Because you would do it. Well, almost, not quite that. He didn't okay. say, I knew you would do it. He just said, you're doing it. Oh, you're doing it. Okay. So I've always said, there's no, you know, the, the way the line goes is that she's saying, why me? And he said, well, you're doing it. But I always say, but you don't know how many people he asked before her. Could have been thousands of people he was talking to for years and years and years who would not do it. And she just was the one who did it. So it's sort of, we're just making the assumption that she was somehow chosen. When the course itself says everyone is called, but few it care to answer the call. So we don't know that he was not talking to thousands and thousands and thousands of people, but she just is the one who said, I'm going to do it which would make perfect sense given everything that was sort of leading up to the experience of them doing it. That one of the things like that Abraham talks about that's interesting, particularly in terms of channeling, is Abraham will say, you can't answer a question that hasn't been asked. You have to, the ask and it is given is you can't answer a question that hasn't been asked. So in so many of these situations, there's a someone who's asking and someone who's answering. And that's the case also. So Bill was the one who was asking. Helen had no interest in any of this stuff. She didn't give a shit about any of this stuff. But Bill was Bill. asking. <laughs> and so she became the vessel through which it came. 
Esther Hicks had no interest in any of this stuff. She didn't care anything about higher thoughts or any of that stuff. Jerry was the one who was interested in it. Jerry was the one who was asking the questions. And then it came through Esther. And if you go back even to the Seth material with Jane Roberts, it was the same thing again. It was the husband who was interested in asking all these things and this vessel through which the answers came. And oftentimes, it's a little bit different. Well, it's a lot different, I would say, with Esther and Jerry. But I mean, you know, all through A Course of Miracles, it's talking about how uh, sickness is an illusion and the body is an illusion and you can be healed. And then Helen died a horrible death physically, sick for a long time, suffering awful. Seth uh, and Jane Roberts, Jane Roberts, same thing. We're really? teaching the body is an illusion and you da, 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 and anything can be healed. And she had a horrible, even worse than Helen, physical oh. death in the hospital for long periods of time, suffering physically. Um, Elizabeth Clare Prophet died, you know, got Alzheimer's and had a long, like all, all these sort of channeling people <laughs> a lot of times, if they're not actually... Um, because you can do that all that and resist it the whole time. If the if you're staying in the sort of resistant mode, for instance, Jane Roberts died a death almost identical to her mother's death. And she had a horrible relationship with her mother. And so it was almost like that was never going to be let go of. That that was the thing. So she could be spouting all this stuff, you know. Um, and yet again, like Helen, not living it. Yeah, really, it's amazing. Yeah, and they spent so, I mean, Seth, more than most any of those people, uh, just poured out volumes of stuff, like just enormous volumes and volumes of material so that they um, they did almost nothing else. You know, it's interesting because even if you go to like Edgar Casey is a similar thing in that he, I think it's similar with Jane Roberts and Edgar Casey that they just burned themselves out. And the Edgar Casey was more or less told that you need to rest more. You need to stop doing so many readings. And he just wouldn't. And he just basically completely, wow. you just fry the vessel, <laughs> you know? You know, it's really interesting that you're talking about this. And I want to talk about channel material and how it relates to what's going on today. Um, before that, I want to share with you about Paul Selig. Um, Paul Selig's uh, a gay man, and uh, he's been looking for his partner for uh, a very long time. And he and he almost kind of would, you know, shake his fist at the guides that were coming through him because his life was not what he wanted it to be. He was a curmudgeon, mm -hmm. and he uses the word curmudgeon, you know. Mm -hmm. But you know, he has utterly transformed. And he is now abiding and he was a resistant, he channeled the material, mm -hmm. but he would, he, it's a conscious channel. So he would hear that he would hear what the guys would say, and then he'd stop and he'd have a question. So they would say things like, well, we have to take a break now. And, and Paul needs to go take a walk with the dog or something like that because they were, he was continually butting up against them mm -hmm. and the books are completely unedited. There's not anything, nothing edited in the book. So it's exactly as it came through. But he was very resistant in the mm -hmm. early years. Now, with the with the 11th book coming out, um, he's he has gone through such transformation. And it's encouraging in a way, having just listened to you share about how these people struggled, you know, in their lives and being able to apply the material. But I think he is finally doing that. He's applying the material and he has surrendered to mm -hmm. being their guide. His whole life has changed. I mean, he's left NYU and he travels all over the world. And he's got, I don't know how many, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of people. I don't know how many people are following the course. I mean, following um, the word work, but that's an interesting example, you know, of how that's changing. Let, let me ask you this question because it lead into this idea of channeling. Given COVID and the, corruption of politics, the war in Ukraine. You know, I just saw a movie about human trafficking that was just incredible, incredible movie. I mean, this is all happening now, you mm -hmm. know, 
And I, my personal feeling is, you know, when I did that show in the 90s, it was called The Paradigm Shift. And it was the paradigm is shifting. We're waking up to the truth of who we are. We're spiritual beings having a human experience, not the other way around. Well, the paradigm shift is now we're in the middle. I think we're in the middle of this paradigm shift. And Bruce Lipton shared this perfectly. He said, I want to celebrate the fact that we're that COVID is happening. I want to celebrate it because we've been waiting for this paradigm shift for so long. And he, and he would liken humanity to a caterpillar who has gluttonously eaten all these milkweed leaves and now is in breakdown in the chrysalis. So this is where we are right now, I think, because we are in that breakdown into that mushy elixir that will eventually result you know, in the monarch butterfly. So I'd love to get your take on where we are right now and also bringing it back to this resurgence, it seems, of channeled material that channeling is coming out. And I mean, that I don't really know of other channeled material that has come out as recently as the word work, um, but there are a lot of channels that are really happening uh, that are really popular today, like Bashar and, and other groups like that. So anyway, that was a, a, a long lead into what I want to hear from you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I really, honestly, I think it's all bullshit. <laughs> what do you mean? Really all that stuff about what we're going through now and our collective blah, blah, blah. Spiritual people have been saying this since the beginning of time. That this is the time of da-da-da-da. It's not. (laughs) It's just people incarnating, doing their thing, either getting the lesson or not getting the lesson. All this planetary stuff, it just goes through cycles like this. This resurgence of channeling, all these things are cyclical. All this new thought stuff, whether you call it new age or new thought or metaphysical or whatever you call it, gets really popular for a decade or so. And then it goes away and something else comes and channelers were very popular back like in um 80s well yes but i'm talking about like when we're in our sort of modern metaphysical (laughs) movement you go back to spiritualism so this was back in the 20s and 30s where people were going and seeing spiritualists who were channeling entities who were channeling the dead who were doing all of these things and that was going to be it too And, you know, and it's not, there is no it that we're waiting for. The world is not going to turn into paradise and it's not going to turn into hell. Those are just patterns that happen all the time, cyclically. It's almost like a pendulum. You can just watch it historically. It goes this way and then it goes this way and it goes this way and then it goes this way. So everything is very conservative for a while and then everything is very liberal for a while and then everything is very conservative for a while and then everything is very liberal for a while. It's basically... My thought is it's just spiritual people fall under the hypnotism of hope. Oh, I hope this is going to be it. But it's not. (laughs) It's not going to be it. Because everybody's living in their own reality. Whether it's heaven or hell. Whether it's heaven or hell, everybody's living in their own reality, which is really based on what they're focusing on, what they're thinking about, what they're believing, and what's in their consciousness. So. Where there's always just sort of that hope of, but this is going to be it, and we're really going to wake up, and it's going to have this shift, and it's going to. But I don't believe that for but a second. Jacob, I, well, I okay, I I disagree with you in that. I have observed being a stranger in a strange land most of my life um, out there, <laughs> eyebrow raising people's eyebrows. I think that there is a transformation that is happening. I think the evolution is. Uh, Humanity is evolving. One of the things the guides say in the word work is that, you know, um, I don't know the number of years, but let's say 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, humanity wasn't ready for the information they're bringing forth. Humanity just was not ready because what the guides are talking about is raising our frequency, literally shifting the vibrational frequency of the body, raising us up. And the book is about ascension while you're in the body, ascension while you're in the body. And what they say is that ascension is happening all over the planet. Now, everyone, you know, the, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly, everything is ascending because we are ascending. We are waking up to this truth of who we are. And I look at my life and how it shifted. Finally, at 78, having done my devoted my whole life to service, you know, people are finally beginning to get it that I see, you know, and 
Um, uh, and I feel like, uh, well, let's say, for example, this whole summit conversation, you know, these summits that are happening, you know what summits are? Summits are someone pulling together and having a summit and pulling like 18, 20 people together who are going to talk about something. For example, this transformation, spirituality, transformation summit summits that I go on. I have an opportunity to speak for 25 minutes to whoever mm -hmm. wants to sign up for it. It's free and everyone has an opportunity to, to move their work forward. Well, right. this was never happening before. Uh -huh. And you were not finding groups like this that are reaching out globally to people that are coming in. I mean, I'm getting people that are recognizing me and what I'm up to that are from South Africa and from Spain and from all these different places. Mm -hmm. So I think that it is happening. People mm -hmm. are waking up. That was all happening with Paramahansa Yogananda. It was happening decades and decades ago. This has always been going on. <laughs> what You're projecting that is the thing. Oh, okay. When you say what I'm observing, you're observing what you're projecting. The mind just gathers evidence for what it wants to believe. So you are finding people that are in alignment with what you want to believe, which is great. But now you've made it a picture of something bigger rather than just, I'm drawing to meet people who are interested in my work. That's actually what's happening. Yes. But you've made it a bigger story of that's what's happening in the world. No, what's happening in the world is everybody is attracting what they're focused on. Okay, well, you know, you're giving me food for thought here because, um, well, maybe it's because I'm a cosmic optimist. My mother used to call me a Pollyanna. <laughs> but I, I guess this is, this is, this is, my, well, then I'm projecting this. So this is what I'm projecting that. We are waking up to the truth that we're God in the body and that we're wearing this mask and this meat suit, you know, and that this is all an illusion that we're creating with our thoughts, feelings, and words, right? And as people do that and wake up to that, and more and more of us do that, then we can create collectively, you know, a better world. As more and more people wake up to this, we can create, we can co-create. But a what you're world. saying right now is exactly what the Nazis are saying. What? Yes, they're saying people are finally waking up to the fact that the races should be different and some of us are better than others. Do you understand? Everybody thinks their way is the way and that people are waking up to them. Leave the world out of it, I say. Uh-huh. Who cares what the world is doing? Stop paying attention to the world. It's that focus on... Let me see what's happening. Let me gauge what's happening. Oh, look how horrifying that is. But maybe we can fix it. Leave the world out of it. Jesus said you will always have the poor with you. If you run into them, give them some money, give them some clothes, and go about your day. His whole ministry was forget about the world. You're not going to fix the world. That's why he was rejected is because they wanted a, uh, their thought was the Messiah will save us from the world. We've been enslaved. We pay all these high taxes. The Messiah will save us. And Jesus said, I'm not going to save you. Forgive your enemies. Bless those that curse you and forget about it. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and go on with your day. There's no, I'm not starting a political movement. I'm not starting a church. I'm not starting anything. Forget about the world. This is why the Course in Miracles says, seek not to change the world, but choose to change your mind about the world. But people love this. Thing of we're changing the world it, yeah like I, let I, the I world it, be i know it begins with changing ourselves yeah i know it begins no, with changing ourselves. it doesn't begin with changing ourselves it begins and ends with changing yourself there's nothing else to change okay that's the frustration that spiritual people often get to then is mm -hmm. Not just staying in your own yard, but then now how can I be the change? <laughs> People take that saying, uh, be the saying. change you want to see in the world. And what they really mean is you be the change I want to see in the world. Okay. I'll just do this and then you'll change and then I'll be happy because... People believe in peace like I do, or people believe in love like I do, or people believe in equality like I do, and now I'm happy. Well, leave them out of it. 
This is the whole thing in A Course in Miracles, which is about seek not to change the world. But then it says, anytime you're trying to change someone else in any way, even to improve their life, that's your ego. Mm -hmm. Anytime you seek to, it says, when you correct a brother, you believe correction by you is possible. And this can only be the arrogance of the ego. So that's so much of this, you know, you're going to be more loving. You're going to be this. You're going to be that. That's the whole thing why it's so hard, forgiveness in A Course in Miracles, because it says what you do isn't even relevant. It's not even relevant. The fact that I was molested, the fact that you cheated me in business, the fact that all of that, I'm going to leave you out of the equation. It is the sole responsibility of the miracle worker to accept the atonement for themselves and leave the world out of it. But this sells. It sells books, it sells seminars, it sells all kinds of stuff. This is no different than what happened in the 80s with the Whole Life Expo, where these Whole Life Expos would come in, all these people were coming in, again, with this whole same thing of, we're going to change the world our way. One of the Miracle Distribution Center conferences that I spoke at was at the Anaheim Convention Center. And it was the only year they did it there, because I guess they couldn't get the other space. And the Anaheim Convention Center is enormous. There were just three different groups meeting that weekend. And one of them was the Miracle Distribution Center Conference. So the whole belief system is based around, there's this woman who channeled Jesus and wrote this book about forgiveness. There was another group there that were all, um, and this was like 20 years ago. So it was before all this was even as popular as it is now, was all about aliens and spaceships and there were a lot of people there dressed like aliens. I remember. Alien that. costumes and things. <laughs> then there was this other group that was like sort of a mystery in a way. And it was because they didn't really have, which, you know, I found out later is sort of how they do things. That was, they had set up their rooms and there's a big science front that said the history of psychiatry. And so you go in there and it was all these horrors of psychiatry and terrible things that had been done, experiments and all this stuff. Well, they were actually secretly Scientologists, <laughs> you know, who don't believe in psychiatry, but they weren't saying we're Scientologists. So, so here were these three different groups who were all saying totally different things, who were all like, we're the answer. And we're going to change the planet. And we're the ones who don't know. So at this particular conference, gosh, I can't remember his name right now. Targ, I think was his name. But he was um, in the CIA. He was actually one of the main guys who were doing the CIA psychic experiments of remote viewing and you know, all of that stuff. And he had been asked to speak of the mirror. So he told this story of being at the conference when he gave his talk and that he was on the escalator coming up with some guy who's dressed totally like an alien. And he's talking, they're just having a, a brief chat. And so the guy, the alien guy is talking about how we're all being abducted and da 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 and there's a big change coming. We're gonna da 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 And then this guy Targ says, I'm here at the Miracle Distribution Center conference, and it's a book of channel material written by Jesus. And the alien guy goes, oh, we don't believe in that. So it was like it was too weird for him. Like everything's too weird for somebody else. <laughs> oh, that I don't believe in that. Or I don't believe in that. Or I don't believe in that. So this whole idea that it even matters what anybody believes or what anybody else is doing, if you really understand that your consciousness is creating your own experience all the time, and it will always look to you like it looks to you. Right, perception. It will all be the perception. This is why the Course says projection makes perception. So, you know, I don't think you should think any differently than you do <laughs> right now. But you ask me, what do I think about it? That's what I think about it. But I don't expect anyone to agree with me. It doesn't matter to me. You know, what? whatever makes you happy or makes somebody else happy, I don't care what anybody believes. That's really, this is one of the huge things that I got years and years ago is 
oh, that's none of my business. <laughs> that is none of my business. <laughs> my own thinking and consciousness, that's my business. Yeah. What other people believe, in, if it makes them yeah, happy. Terry then, Cole Whitaker, right? She wrote the book, What Other People Think of Me is None of My Business. It's none of my business. So, but I'm but it but that's doesn't take it far enough. It's what anybody thinks at all is none of my business. Okay, so throwing you're throwing a, a, a pebble in my I don't know if that's the right metaphor, but in your pond. <laughs> my pond, my pebble in my pond. Uh you're a spiritual teacher. This is what you're up to. You've been up to this since the time you were a young boy, based on your sharing, going all the way back to Catholicism. Yeah. So you are here in the world projecting your perception, you know, to help people, correct? Not really. I used to think <laughs> that, and it was just such a miserable way to live. You just leave them out of it. So what are you doing then? Why are you doing this? All anybody's ever doing is talking to themselves. And I've said that for decades now, and I don't say it all the time anymore. I used to say it regularly when I was doing a lot of public lecturing because new people would be coming in all the time. So I would say, I'm so thankful that you came here to hear me talk to myself. And you have to pay. <laughs> That's all. I'm just talking to myself. And people listen or they don't listen. They believe or they don't believe. It helps them or it doesn't help them. That's none of my business. That's way above my pay scale. <laughs> That's way above my cosmic pay scale. I just show up prepared. This is my whole motto that I've taught people for years and years. I show up prepared, on time, doing what I said I would do with a good attitude. Everything else is out of my control. That's my path to happiness and joy and peace. Because if I bring other people into it, now I'm in their business and in their yard. Did you get something out of it? Did you like what I said? Did it help you? Did it heal you? Because I just don't give a flying F. What happens is people will come up to me and say, oh, you were talking about exactly what we were talking about in the car and the way here. You were talking about such as, well, I couldn't possibly know that on a conscious level. But if I go into a situation, and so much of what, this helping is about is oftentimes just manipulation and control. I'm going to manipulate you into being the way I want you to be, which is healed and whole or happy or peaceful or whatever. That you cannot help then, but to some degree, be trying to manipulate and control the situation. Um, even in setting up the environment. Oh, I want it to be, I did that for years and it just sucks where I would think, well, I want to make it so it will be, you know, we'll have nice flowers, we'll have good music, we'll have da-da-da, we'll set the tone. Da -da. Well, then, after I'd done that for years and was just so frustrated, because it's exhausting to be trying to control conditions and circumstances. So in about 2005, I stopped doing the things I'd been doing for years. And I left lecturing at the churches and I started lecturing on Sunday mornings at this little hotel in San Diego in their meeting room, which was a dump. It was just a dump. And I was in absolute total surrender at that time of, I'm just doing this for fun. That's all, all I care about is my joy and my fun. So I was going to just leave this career entirely, get an office job and just lecture for fun. So what I loved about it was, cause I'd been in all these pretty rooms and all this stuff and all the aggravation that came with it. When I started being in this dumpy room in San Diego, I knew everybody was there for the right reason. They weren't gonna meet anyone. It wasn't a pretty place, it wasn't a place to be seen. There was nothing hip about it. It was a hot little room with an air conditioner, the blue hot air. I knew everybody was there, <laughs> was only there for the message. There was no other reason to be there. And I was there because it was fun. I like talking to myself and teaching myself. And what was the message? 
it was everything I always teach all the time. It was no different. It's just that now I wasn't concerned about anything else. I didn't care whether they got anything out of it. I didn't care whether anybody got healed. I didn't care if anybody applauded. I didn't care what the room looked like. I didn't give a shit about anything but me showing up prepared on time, doing what I said I would do with a good attitude. And I would literally say, I don't know, I can't say the things that I said on this podcast because I would tell people right (laughs) at the gate, this is it. And if you don't like it, F you. And there's the door. And nobody asked you to be here. And you have to pay. There's no suggested donation. If you don't pay, get the F out. You're not welcome here. I just made it super, super plain. And it grew like crazy. Because finally, people could feel nobody's hyping me. Nobody's promising me a new world. Nobody's telling me this or that. They're just giving me the meat. There's no frills around it. There's no dessert. This is just it. Well, and what, that turned and around. what's the meat? And what's the meat, Jacob? Just what I've told you. You're creating your own experience all the time. You can I surrender to God or you can do it your own way. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not going to make any difference to the universe. It's going to make all the difference in the world to you. You can, again, just like you, you can be right or you can be happy. Right. You can stay in your own yard. And be happy, or you can be miserable going crawling over the fence into other people's yard, trying to fix them, trying to change them, trying to make them happy, trying to fix the world, trying to do all these things that'll just make you frustrated and depressed. Or you could just get back in your own yard and appreciate what you have, and you will draw to you people who resonate with that. And you'll be sent people. So you'll be sent people who are ready for whatever you have to give. Even if they're not ready for it big time, they might be ready for it. I mean, I've heard from people who, when I moved back here uh, in March, I went to a dry cleaners and the woman um, who was working at the counter, when I gave her my name, she said, oh my God, you're Jacob Glass. I didn't recognize you. And I used to come to your lectures when you were at Victoria Hall and people would, and I don't know why, because my language is terrible, but people would bring their children sometimes. Well, she would bring her son. And so I've never heard from him. I don't know who he is or anything, but she said to me, "Um, my son loves you. He said that you helped him so much when he went to rehab. Well, she just meant things he'd heard decades before when he was a kid because he wasn't communicating with me. I wasn't counseling him or anything. I didn't even know who he was. So I had the more I'm detached from results. Am I helping people? Is the world getting better? Is this happening? Am I this? Am I the? The more I'm detached from the results and I'm just in, I'm just showing up prepared, on time, doing what I said I would do with a good attitude, everything else is out of my control, then that people are being helped. There was a famous, I don't know if it was Emer, I think it was Thoreau, who said, he said, if I knew that someone was on their way over to my house to help me, I would run for my life. So many people who think they're helping need to just get back in their own yard. <laughs> it will ripple out from there, but we're so uh, concerned with things that are beyond our control. Well, I'm not interested in control. I'm interested in God influence. I can have an influence, but I'm not controlling anything, and I'm not attached to what's happening in the world. Mm-hmm. There, w- there will be wars and rumors of wars. This has always been, everything that's been going on is always going on and is always going to go on. Really? You think there's going to be, you think, excuse me for interrupting you, but you think there's going to be wars, you know, 20 years from now? There are wars right now. Yes, of course there will be. (laughs) There's wars all the time. Listen, here's the thing that I tell people all the time is the civil war never ended. People talk about the civil war is on and thriving even more than ever before. People think, oh, we won the Civil War. No, we used to have Black people on plantations. Now we just put them in jail. The Civil War never ended. No war has ever ended or been won. 
Every war just goes on and on and on, but it changes form. World War II did not rid the world of Nazis or of anti-Semitism. It's having a field day today. It has arisen like from out of the ashes because the internet makes it easier for these people to find mm. each other. So just like people go, well, all us spiritual people are finding each other and there's so much interest in it. There's so much interest in racism now. There is a thriving interest in anti-Semitism. Both of those things are growing exponentially across the planet. So that's why I'm always saying, like, don't get invested in what's happening on the planet. Get invested in how am I creating what I want to see in my own life? And it will draw to it more of that. Okay, well, we're going to definitely need to do a part two because I want to have this conversation <laughs> with you. you know, and, and, and I, I feel that, this is my perspective. Mm -hmm. I feel that if everyone on the planet, if everyone knew who they are in truth, like who they are, spirit mm -hmm. and form showing up and having a human experience, if everybody knew this, mm -hmm. there would be you know, there would be peace on the planet. There would be... Um, the planet uh, would disappear. You think the planet would disappear? Yes. It's just a classroom. When you don't need the classroom, it disappears. Yeah, okay. This is a world of contrast. This is a world of contrast. As soon as there's no contrast, the world will vanish. So it's not like, oh, it'll be peaceful and then we'll live in peace. If the second the whole world is peaceful, it will vanish. Everything will go straight to the non-physical. Wow. Okay. Well, listen, I, you know, I need to bring us to a close because I have another appointment coming up, but this has been wonderful. And I definitely want to have a part two with you because, you know, you're stirring me up here around all of this because I've been about, you know, I've been about service my whole life. And, um, I, and I do want to make a difference. I do want to make my contribution to the world. And even if that contribution is just saying, okay, Patricia, wake up. You are not this blah, 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 little molested girl, blah, 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 blah. All of that is a, was an illusion. You know, everything is still an illusion. And you are, yeah, I guess I, I am talking to myself when I'm, when I'm sharing with clients. Yeah. Because one of the things so, that the Course says is, I need do nothing. That's true. I and need this whole thing of, I want to make a contribution. I want to da, 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 da. Again, this is so nonsensical. Because you make a contribution by just existing. But you think you have to do something to make a contribution. What about the person who is a vegetable, supposedly, in a coma in a bed? Should we just kill them? Because they're not making a contribution. What's their contribution? You're useless if you're not making a contribution. You should be helping somebody. You should be doing something. It's not about a doing. Jesus mostly went to parties. He was just going around and some people would stop him so he would heal them. And then he'd go on to his party, <laughs> go on to the wedding. He would go on to a dinner. He would go on here. He would talk to people who just showed up, but he wasn't like, get out there, save the world. He was saying, teach people, you know, that they're fine, that they're abundant, that God loves them. Love one another as I've loved you. And just move on. And he said to the apostles, go into a town. And if they don't want to hear what you have to say, just leave. Wipe the dust off your feet and leave. He didn't say, stay until they get it. Wake them all up. Don't stop trying. Make your contribution. He just said, if they don't want to hear it, just leave. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not a big deal. You didn't fail. Just go. They don't want to hear it. Okay. Well, you'll be willing to come on and do a part two with me? At some point, yes. At some point. Okay, good. All right. So uh, usually I close the show by asking for a pearl of wisdom for our listeners and our viewers. And I mean, you gave us many pearls today, but what what would be coming right? What would you like to say right now to close this conversation? God's will for you is happiness. God's will for you is happiness, not suffering, not struggle not making a difference, not doing, just happiness. That happiness is, well, I would go, A Course in Miracles says that it's happiness, but I would say more joy. Joy. 
happiness is usually based on I'm happy about something. I'm happy that this is happening. I'm happy that that's happening. But so it can be an up and down experience, whereas joy can be there even if you don't like what's going on. Right. You know, um, I've rekindled an interest in Michael Singer's books, you know, The Untethered Soul oh, and, and The Surrender Experiment. And what I took away from The Surrender Experiment was make a choice for unconditional happiness. Yeah. I thought, wow. Yeah unconditional happiness that means that matter what is happening in your life you choose happiness and i think this is probably the what you're saying here is that you know is is choose that unconditional choice of happiness no matter whether there's wars happening or this happening or that happening unconditional happiness so maybe that's how it's i'm getting really what you're, you're saying here because i've got thrown a little bit today about what you said. It's okay. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay because I'm, you know, I'm willing to learn and grow and stretch. No. So Jacob, you're a doll. Thank you so much. And I will see you at Unity. All right. Now, when you, on Monday. Now, so you're coming, you're at Unity. The first, first Monday, Monday of every month. Yeah. The first one Monday, Monday month. of every month. Yeah. And I didn't even touch upon your books and your journals and everything that you're doing, but, um, I'm delighted that you came on the show today and I'm, and I'm delighted that you're pushing my envelope a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Patricia. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. Bye -bye. And thank you all for listening and viewing this wonderful conversation with Jacob Glass and it's going to be continued in the not too distant future. So thanks for watching. Thanks for joining me today on Align with the Divine Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. And if you'd like to learn more about my work, I invite you to my website, alignwiththedivine.net. And on the homepage, I'm giving away a free gift. It's a masterclass I did called The Seven Keys to Successful Manifesting. It pretty much lays out the bones of my work. Also, for a limited time only, between now and the end of August, just for the summer, I'll be giving complimentary Tarot sessions, 30-minute sessions valued at $90. So if you're interested, reach out to me using my email, patricia at patriciadiorio.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks again for joining me today, and namaste.